Really a great joy to introduce our guest speaker to you today. It's such a blessing to have back with us our friend, Pastor Phil Mason from Australia. We haven't had Pastor Phil back since 2016. Uh, if you haven't met Pastor Phil, he and his wife, Maria, founded a church 20 years ago called The Tribe. I, I think that's cool. How many of you know we're God's tribe on this earth? Amen. And uh, they run a ministry training school called Nioth College. Nioth is where Samuel uh, had his first school of the prophets, so that's pretty neat. Uh, Pastor Phil is a very sought-after conference speaker. In fact, uh, after he leaves us today, later in the week, he's heading out to the Midwest. He's going to be speaking at a prophetic conference uh, in Lou Engle, uh, with Lou Engle out in uh, Iowa. He is the number of, uh, he's the author of, uh, I need him to pray for my speech before he leaves today. <laughs> Phil is the author of a lot of very impactful books. We're very thankful that he was able to bring some of his materials, his audio materials, and his books uh, here with us. Make sure you take uh, advantage of what's out there on the book table before you leave today. Uh, Church, I want to let you know, the last time that Pastor Phil was with us in 2016... Uh, he just deposited such a beautiful word into our hearts uh, about the Father's love. And uh, this morning again in the 9 a.m. service, our hearts were just so blessed by what he has to share. So please open your hearts uh, to the servant of God as he comes. Would you stand and just give your best welcome this morning for Pastor Phil Mason as he comes to share. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Great to be back with you guys, and uh, you get to listen to my Aussie accent for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the incredible power of your Word, the living Word of God, and we gather around uh, the very throne of heaven right now, Lord, to hear your voice. Father, I pray that your voice would just penetrate every heart that our hearts would be wide open to receive revelation that would lead us into deeper encounter with you, Lord. And I pray this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Great to be back with you. Two years ago, I was here, and uh, it's so good to be back. It's so great to see your new building, and uh, you can really sense the, the, the spiritual growth in the, in the house as well. I love the worship in this place. It's so good. For the past 13 years or so, my wife and I have been leading a ministry into the premier New Age conference, uh, festivals in Australia. It's called Mind, Body, Spirit. And we've been taking teams into these festivals. I think we've done about 50 major outreaches into these festivals. And they cost a lot of money. They're expensive to, because we, get, well, we hire a booth in there. And, and we have opportunity to... Um, just release the kingdom of God, the presence of God upon all these people who are genuine seekers, but they've been obviously sort of almost like, you know, hijacked on the, the call of God that's on their life. And they're, they're trying to respond to that in, in the best way they can, but they often get drawn into New Age spirituality. In fact, I came out of the New Age in 1979, and I was pretty immersed in New Age thinking and I was like a New Age evangelist because I was buying New Age books, giving them away. I just kind of, you know, I guess I was being called by God and, and I got you know, trapped in the New Age. And so the Lord's used me ever since then to go back into these festivals and uh, I train teams to go into the festival. And one of the main things that we do, apart from releasing physical healing, which we see a lot of, is to release what we call supernatural encounters. And they are incredibly popular uh, with people because they are spiritual seekers. You want to go where the fish are biting, right? And who likes fishing in um, creeks and, and rivers where there's just no fish? You just don't want to do it. But you do want to go where the fish are biting. And uh, certainly in these festivals, people are really open and, and uh, wide open. They're too open, actually. They're, they're open to everything. That's their problem. <laughs> they're kind of open to everything. And uh, so we um, take the presence of God into these, into these festivals and one of the things that we stick up on our booth is supernatural encounters. Now, the art of leading someone into a supernatural encounter with Jesus um, is a skill that uh, really only can flow out of the place of being in encounter with God. Now, all of us are called to a lifestyle of encountering God, not just to believe in God, but to encounter God. And so, we found that the deeper we've gone in our own personal spiritual journey with the Lord, 
the, the, the greater uh, level of encounter that we can bring others into. It's almost like they come under our atmosphere that we're carrying in that place. And we see people having some pretty powerful encounters with the Lord. Um, we've seen approximately 15,000 healings in these festival outreaches that we've been doing for the last 13 years, which is an astonishing figure. We see hundreds of healings happen in every festival that we go into. People's lives are, are radically touched by God. We always get to lead people to Jesus. I'm also a New Age seminar speaker. Don't flee the building. Um, I uh, do a seminar which is titled Quantum Physics and the Supernatural Realm. And I do about a 30-minute presentation. And because I'm talking about the supernatural and I'm talking about the quantum physical world, I wrote a book, by the way, called Quantum Glory. And it's out there on the table and it describes the science of heaven invading earth. And so I do a, a seminar presentation, and then I say to everybody, well, we're going to do a demonstration right now. And I invite people out who have neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, something like that, and we get every single person healed in front of a crowd of people. And I'm not exaggerating, every person gets healed, and it's really quite jaw-dropping to see what God does when, when you know, one after the other gets healed and then the next person comes up and I'm like look I don't know you do I, I haven't like slipped you 10 bucks to sort of fake this whole thing and they're like never met you in my life and then we go well, what's your problem and you know they're like neck pain and we put a hand on their neck Jesus just comes and just touches them and it's in front of this big crowd of people so it's really exciting to see the Lord really um, touching a lot of people in, in that community and so supernatural encounters are, are are really um, about bringing somebody into an experience of the presence of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus, or of the revelation of Jesus. And we're all about bringing people into a life-changing encounter with God. And, you know, Jesus said, freely you receive, freely give. And the way the kingdom flows is it flows into our lives and then it flows through our lives and we can only give away what we've received. We can't give away what we haven't received. So the more we're receiving ourselves from the presence, receiving His love, receiving deeper revelation, receiving just the impartation of His power into our lives, the more the, the revelation, the love, and, and the power of God flows through us into other people's lives. And the, the key, I believe, to this journey that uh, God wants to raise up um, a company of beloved sons and daughters who are equipped to give away God encounters, to actually become a God encounter in other people's lives. Because Christ lives in us and He wants to reveal Himself through us, not just through the preaching of the Word, but also through signs and wonders, through the demonstrations of power, through the prophetic, through all of the different gifts of the Holy Spirit that God has poured out upon His church. Now, I want to talk about our journey of sonship with you today. I believe all of us are called to get on a journey of growing in our sonship relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. All of us are adopted into the family of God. We are all the sons and daughters of God. And Paul tells us that we are being conformed to the very image of His beloved Son. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 uh, in the Passion Translation, it says, For God knew all about us before we were born, and He predestined, that's a predetermined destination, He predestined us from the beginning to share the likeness of His Son. This means the Son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like Him. We are being conformed to the image of His Son. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And there's a purpose for all of that because Paul says also in Romans chapter 8, and this is again then the Passion Translation in verse 19, he says, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. I love that, standing on tiptoes, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters because you are carriers of the glory of God. Christ in you, the confident expectation of glory being manifested in and through your life because of the indwelling of Christ, the Son of God. And I want to start by looking at John chapter 1, verse 1. All of us are familiar with John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, uh, down in verse 14 of, of John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
I want to read this to you this morning out of the, uh, the Voice Bible. I don't know if you've heard of the Voice Bible. It's a, a translation of the, of the Scriptures. And it says, and I found out why it's called the Voice Bible. Listen to this. Before time itself was measured, the voice was speaking. The voice was and is God, the Word. This celestial Word remained ever-present with the Creator. His speech shaped the entire cosmos. This is Jesus, the Word of God. He spoke and the universe came into existence. And so, this voice, we read in verse 14, the voice took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside us. We have seen Him enveloped in undeniable splendor, the one true Son of the Father. God, unseen until now, is revealed in the voice. God's only Son, straight from the Father's heart. Isn't that beautiful? The voice became flesh. He was the one true Son of the Father, straight from the Father's heart. And so, everything God wants to say to you and I is revealed in the person of Jesus, the beloved Son, the eternal Son of the Father, who has lived in eternal fellowship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The eternal Father, the eternal Son, and the eternal Holy Spirit. And God manifested Himself on the earth through the very voice of God that created the universe. And we find out that this voice is His beloved Son. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it opens with these words. In past times, God, sorry, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. The contrast there, of course, is between the prophets of the Old Testament and the Son of God being manifested in the world. Now, in the Passion Translation, listen to what uh, Brian Simmons did with this in his glorious Passion Translation. Throughout our history, God has spoken to our ancestors by His prophets in many different ways. The revelation He gave them was only a fragment at a time, building one truth upon another. But to us, living in these last days, God now speaks to us openly in the language of a son. The language of a son. And Brian puts a little footnote at the bottom and he says, we speak in English, God speaks in son. For Jesus is the language of God. The sonship of Jesus is the language he now uses to speak to us. So God has chosen to speak to us in a very unique way by sending His one and only, eternally beloved Son from the, the white hot center of His throne room presence. He sent forth Jesus into this world and Jesus came as the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, who came from the Father's side, straight from the Father's heart. And everything about Jesus is a revelation of who God is, right down to the facial expression, the smile, the wink, you know, that, that beautiful look in His glorious face. Everything about Jesus reveals. He reveals the Father. He's the visible image of the invisible God. And so this word, Son, is a very contextualized word. It has context. It has meaning. It means if you say someone is a son, it means they have a father. If you say someone is a son, it means they come from a family. If you say they are a son, it means they belong. There's a sense of family identity. And Jesus came with this incredible sense of family, eternal family identity. And so the Father sent His Son into the world. And we know this famous passage in John chapter 3. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Now God's answer to the cry of humanity is to send His beloved Son. God's solution is always to send a Son. Contrast that with an orphan. Now, an orphan 
as distinct from a son, cannot point to the existence of their father or mother or their family or their sense of belonging. Some orphans don't even have a sense of family identity because maybe they never even knew their father or mother. And so you can't send an orphan into a, into a crisis, like the crisis that's going on on planet Earth. That's not going to have an impact. You've got to send a son. And the thing is, God sent his son to the orphans of this world. And Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. In John 14, I won't leave you in that orphan state. Every one of us, outside of Christ, were orphans in relation to God our Father. So he adopts us into his family. In fact, if you think of it like this, God sent his beloved son who became an orphan on the cross so that the orphans can become the sons and daughters of God. Isn't that incredibly glorious? That's what our Father has done. He's adopted us into his family through his blood, through the shedding of his blood, he's adopted us into his family. So God's solution is to send a son. Now, sonship in the New Testament is framed around this word apostle. Um, Jesus is described as the apostle and high priest of our confession in the book of Hebrews. Now, the Hebrew word, sorry, the Greek word for apostle is apostolos. The Greek word for send is apostello, and really what apostle means is a sent one, one who has been sent, that's what apostle means. And when you read the word send in the New Testament, it's apostello. So God sent his son. That makes Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. And so an apostle is just simply a sent one. Now, if you read the Gospel of John carefully, and I hope you all do read the Gospel of John because I just think it's just an astonishing revelation of Jesus. All through the Gospel of John is Jesus saying over and over, the Father has sent His Son into the world. God, you know, God so loved the world, He sent His Son. And um, further on, you know, uh, Jesus says, uh, the Father has sent me. You do not believe the one He has sent. This is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one He has sent. Jesus said, I live by the power of the living Father who sent me. I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Now, there's a whole list of these. There's actually 15 in total that I counted in the Gospel of John, where Jesus talks about being sent. Now, he is apostolic because he is sent from the Father. In the same way Paul says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, that means he has been chosen, set apart, raised up, and now sent by God. So that's the nature of the apostolic. And so really this is the framework of the entire Gospel of John. And this theme of sonship, or sending his son, as simple as it is, is very, very profound. And uh, for example, Jesus tells a parable, and the parable is very much like Hebrews chapter 1. God sends a series of prophets to Israel preaching the message, preaching the Word of God, and He sends one prophet, and they, they kill him, they throw him out of the vineyard. Um, so the vineyard owner sends another prophet, and they kill him, and uh, then the third prophet is sent, and the same story, they killed that prophet as well. And then God, in the middle, Jesus tells this story, and in the middle of it, He says, um, the owner of the vineyard says, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. Of course, the story is they killed him as well. But he said, what shall I do? God's answer is to send a son. For unto us a son is given. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. So Jesus says, I won't leave you as orphans. He says in the same verse, John 14, verse 18, I won't leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Now here's the problem. The world is full of spiritual orphans who don't know their Father in heaven. So what does Jesus say? I'm not going to leave you in that orphan state. I will come to you, but when he says I'll come to you, he means I will come inside of you. <laughs> and the Spirit of the Son enters our heart 
And Paul describes this in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. He says, God has not given you a spirit of slavery that leads to fear, but he has given you a spirit of adoption as sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And in the next verse, he says, and the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, that we are sons and daughters. And so you've been given the spirit of adoption. But that is just the beginning because Paul says in the next verse, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit comes alongside you. Well, he dwells within you, but he's alongside you as your counselor. And he is testifying day and night, moment by moment. He is your own resident prophet walking with you day and night, moment by moment, prophesying to you, you are the beloved son. You are the beloved daughter. And that is the nature of the prophetic ministry. He is prophesying to you continuously until the penny drops and you go, oh, That's my new identity. I don't need to strive any longer to try and manufacture an identity to be loved and accepted. He has already bestowed the highest identity upon you and I that he could bestow upon any human being, and that is the identity of a beloved son and daughter. You now stand in the righteousness of Christ. God has imparted to your spirit man the very righteousness of Christ, his own divine nature of perfect righteousness. He has imparted that righteousness to you and the result of that is you now have perfect right standing before God. Jesus is not ashamed to call you brothers and sisters. We are on a level playing field with Jesus because the Father did it. It's not because of anything that we could do to get us into that place. It's, it's the work of God. It's the impartation of the free gift of righteousness, which is perfect right standing. And we now stand before God, and Jesus is like, come on, these are my brothers, these are my sisters. We are a new order of humanity. We are a new company of people called the sons and daughters of God. It's no longer God's one and only son. It's now Jesus and a whole family of beloved sons and daughters standing before the throne of God for all eternity. And so Jesus prays in John 17, and John has written down this glorious high priestly prayer. And Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, even as we are one, Father. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And here it it is, listen to this. And that the world may know that you have sent me, the beloved Son, and that you have loved them, as you have loved me, that you've loved them just as much as you have loved me. Now, this is where your security comes from. You know how much need there is in this world for security? Every human being is deeply insecure outside of Jesus, striving to try and create an identity to be loved and accepted. God does it supernaturally by giving you a brand new identity, which is beloved son, beloved daughter. We're told that he is bringing many sons to glory. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. What does that mean? It means the entire company of the redeemed are being brought into a place of encountering the king of glory. That's what we're talking about. When we talk about glory, Jesus said, the glory you gave me, Father, I've given them that the world will know that you love them as much as you love me. It's the glory of his love. It's glorious love radiant, glorious love that is radiating down upon us, just like the sun is shining down upon the earth as we speak, as we're here today. The sun is, I love this open um, roof you've got here. It's a great idea. You know, we stand beneath the sun, and on a beautiful day, you go out and you stand in the sun, and you just get radiated. You get radiated by the the fire of the sun. It's an impartation of energy. It's an impartation of power, solar power. You can get unlimited power from the sun. You can get unlimited light and illumination from the sun. You can get unlimited warmth and love from the sun. And that's who Jesus is. He is the sun of righteousness. He shines like the sun and he radiates down upon each one of his beloved sons and daughters. God is bringing many sons to glory. 
But it doesn't stop there. You and I are called to shine like the sun in our Father's kingdom. Jesus said that. We're called to let our light so shine that people will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We're called to live in such a way that we carry the very heart of the Father and we receive His love continuously and it transforms us from glory to glory as He brings those many sons to glory. Now, Jesus tells a parable And in this parable, it gets right to the heart of the purposes of God for our generation and for every generation on the earth. And it's the parable of the wheat and the tares. And the disciples did not understand what this parable meant. They had no idea. And they're like, Jesus, could you explain the parable of the the weeds in the field, the wheat and the weeds? What's this all about? And so he said, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, Jesus, the son comes and now he sows the good seed and he says the field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom what is he sowing into the world beloved sons beloved daughters like seed we are the good seed and the more he raises you up as mature sons and daughters the deeper level of encounter you can give away to others. You can literally become a walking, talking encounter with the Lord. And when you get the gifts activated, the gift of healing, the gift of the prophetic, and so on, uh, when the gifts begin to flow, there's this other element that comes in. It's not just pouring out love on others. It's also these incredible gifts that God gives to His church. I've seen so many healings. I have seen thousands of healings. The journey the Lord's had me on brings me up close and personal to the lives of of pre-Christians all the time who don't know Jesus, and I watch the power of God come and touch their lives. I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of extraordinary healings. Every one of them has been a revelation to me of the glory of God, of who God is, and, and just His love for people. So God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son, but God so loves the world that he now wants to send a great company of beloved sons and daughters and sow them like seed into the world. Paul describes us as living epistles. He says, you are an epistle of Christ. I'm going to read this to you out of the Voice Bible. You are our letter. You're, You're the Father's love letter to this world. Every word burned onto our hearts to be read by everyone. Wow, every word burned onto our heart. Remember when Jesus spoke on the Emmaus Road and the disciples said, did not our hearts burn within us? Paul goes on, he says, you are the living letter of the anointed one, the liberating king, nurtured by us and inscribed not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. A letter too passionate to be chiseled onto stone tablets, but emblazoned upon the human heart. Isn't that good? Every word burned onto our heart, emblazoned onto human hearts. The message says, your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it. Only God can write such a letter. His letter wasn't written out with ink on paper, with pages and pages of legal footnotes, killing your spirit. It's written with spirit on spirit, His life on our lives. Incredible. So we are living epistles of Christ. And as you go deeper, as I go deeper, in this journey of discovering the dimensions of our sonship, and that's, of course, gender inclusive, we are on this journey into the heart of the Father as He pours His love out on us. And John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. It's a unique quality of love that Jesus lavished upon His disciples. It's adoptive love. The love of the Father is adoptive love. He adopts us. And the effect of His adoption of us 
is that it gives us a capacity energized by heaven's love to be able to adopt our brothers and sisters in Christ as family in the local church. Where we literally are given a capacity to say, I receive you as my brother. I receive you as my sister. I welcome you into my life. I embrace you. I adopt you. You see, an orphan can't do that. An orphan can't minister adoption. But a beloved son and daughter can. And this is the nature of the journey that God has us on. And there are some clear indicators on this journey that we are growing in love, that we're being perfected in love, to use the Apostle John's words. And that all fear is being cast out, perfect love cast out all fear. We're not afraid of people moving away from them. We're beginning to move towards them with that spirit of adoption. Paul himself was full of this spirit of adoption. When he planted churches, he always planted them on the foundation of adoptive love. You are the family of God, every one of us standing before the throne of God. And the outpouring, the continuous outpouring of the adoptive love of our Father is transforming us. But something went terribly wrong in the church in Corinth. This Gnostic spirit of higher knowledge came in and all these super apostles were raised up and and started exalting themselves over Paul and they started pushing Paul out of his own church in Corinth. And Paul was like in crisis, like, what are are we going to do? What are we going to do? So he wrote them a letter. It's the letter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. And he says, "I, I write to you, beloved sons, to warn you, he says. I warn you. He says, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you don't have many fathers. I fathered you through the gospel, he said. Therefore, imitate me. He's calling them back from this higher knowledge, this Gnostic spirit that had entered the church, back to the foundation of love. And so he says, you know, though I have speak the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm nothing. Though I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. Love, what he say, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Paul had to get the church back on the foundation of love and brotherhood and connection, heart connection. And instead, the Gnostic spirit came in, and as soon as that Gnostic spirit comes in, it sets up competition in the church. People start competing with, it, with each other. Guess what? He who has the most knowledge wins. And so people strive for all this knowledge, and that's what opens up this Weird stuff that goes on sometimes in in the charismatic world where people are reaching for some kind of higher revelation. Paul says, don't go, go beyond what is written. And he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, you don't have many fathers. And this was the problem. Lots of instructors, but no fathers. He says, therefore, and when you see therefore, you've got to say, what's the therefore? Therefore, therefore, I am sending to you, Timothy, my faithful and beloved son who will remind you of all of my ways as I teach in all the churches. What was the ways of Paul? I will show you a more excellent way, which is the way of love. So Paul had a solution. What will I do? I know I'll send my beloved son, Timothy, following the template, sending beloved sons. So the deeper we experience the Father's love, the greater we are able to manifest that love and give it away. Now I'm just going to spend a couple more minutes just talking about what Jesus did with the disciples in the upper room. After he'd ministered to them for three and a half years, it says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's John 13 verse 1. This is the beginning of the upper room discourse. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the disciples into the upper room and he began... Uh, to, to speak words to them that are recorded from John 13 right through to the end of John chapter 17. We call it the upper room discourse. I call it the upgrade in the upper room. He took the disciples apart on the night that he was betrayed. And listen to this in the Passion Translation. All throughout his time with his disciples, Jesus had demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. And now he longed to show them the full measure of his love. That's the upgrade in the upper room. Now he desired to show them the full measure of his love. And it was in the upper room that he said, as the Father loves me, so I have loved you. And he says, now I want you to love one another as I have loved you. 
As the Father loves me, I pass on the love. It's an anointing. It's an anointing of adoptive love. And Jesus was moving in the most intense anointing of adoptive love. Everyone who came in contact with him felt loved and drawn and welcomed by the heart of Jesus. But now he takes the disciples into the upper room and he takes them through this upgrade. And it says now he wants to show them the full measure of his love. And it's in that upper room that he says, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. John 15 verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I have loved you. It wasn't until later at the end of the Gospel of John, after Jesus was risen from the dead, that he said to the disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I now send you. Now I want you to see the sequence here. Because it's in that framework in John 14 where he says, I won't leave you as orphans. As the Father loved me, I have loved you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. I'll come and live inside of you. And then later on, he commissions them. As the Father sent me, so I now send you. Loved, then sent. Loved, then sent. Who did he give the great commission to? To those who had experienced the outpouring of the adoptive love of the Father for three and a half years. Then he commissioned them. Sometimes what happens is we haven't had the, the healing of that old orphan wound and we still have orphan behavior and orphan thinking. We're thinking like orphans, we're behaving like orphans and we try and preach the gospel out of that old orphan heart and sometimes it makes a worse mess than we intend it to. I mean, it's the best of intentions, but sometimes, and I think all of us have seen situations where the church has really botched it in the marketplace, where we really haven't presented the love message of God, but, but just this other heavy threat message, which doesn't even have the love message. And so Jesus commissioned a bunch of people who had been experiencing the outpouring of adoptive love. Then he sent them out, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So I say that God is healing the orphan, but he's sending the son. All of us are experiencing the outpouring of the love of God in these days. And God wants us to experience and to know the love of God that passes knowledge. See, the whole revelation of Scripture is designed to open up to us this realm of divine encounter. If we don't go into the encounter then all we have is the knowledge. And all of us in this room could tell, tell one another, God is love. But until we start to get that deeper healing in our hearts, some of the old orphan behaviors and orphan thinking sort of lingers in our lives. And, it, and we embarrass ourselves, don't we, sometimes with some of the things that comes out of our mouths. And, but that's the old orphan. That's your old nature. But you've been given a new nature of sonship. And adoptive love is healing that old orphan heart. Jesus, we are told, was, um, actually I'll read the verse to you, Hebrews 3, verse 5. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ as a son over his own house. He was a son. I'm a leader. As a leader, I'm called to pioneer the sonship journey. And leaders need to lead with the heart of a son. Jesus was a son over his house. So the Father's bringing many sons to glory so that He can send many glorious sons out into the world. I've been putting on these um, sunglasses and uh, the, when you put on a new pair of lenses, you begin to see things differently. And I'm seeing everywhere in the New Testament this message, sending beloved sons, sending beloved sons. God sent His one and only Son, and now He's raising up a great company of beloved sons to sow them like seed out into the world. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. God wants to speak again to this world through the language of a son. And that's you and I, living epistles of sonship, who the Lord is raising up, who carry a message that has been burned into our heart by the fire of God's love. And I want you to stand with me right now, because we're just going to come before the Lord in prayer. If we can have the worship team come on up, that would be fantastic. I want you to stand with me. I want to just begin to pray for all of us in this room. Father, we come before you as your redeemed sons and daughters. And now you are setting us on a journey, and we thank you, Father, for the journey of sonship deep into the Father's heart. I thank you, Father, for the outpouring of your great love upon every one of your sons and daughters. Behold what manner of love. It's adoptive love. 
And he wants to emblazon this upon our hearts. Paul says in Colossians 1, we preach to awaken hearts. We preach to awaken hearts. And we just decree hearts waking up in this room to the great love of God, the perfect love of God the infinite and unconditional love of God that heals us and we are freed from all of the old orphan wounds that have just messed us up. You're bringing us into the glory of sonship, Lord, and you're wanting to sow us out into the world as beloved sons that everywhere we go, we carry the Father's heart. We extend the very ministry of adoptive love that Jesus brought to the earth. Father, I thank you for this great company of people, all of us beloved sons and daughters. And I pray, Father, that you would open up new dimensions of experience of your love, Lord. So more than being able to just say, God is love, we experience the love of God. We feel the love of God in our hearts. Orphans no more but beloved sons being healed, being transformed, many sons, many sons coming to glory. And the Lord says He is raising up an apostolic company of people. There will be apostles among them, but the entire church is called to be one holy apostolic church, as the Nicene Creed says. We decree that God is raising up an apostolic community here in this place, in Greenwich, Connecticut. And all over the earth, the Lord is raising up apostolic houses. But it's a new expression of the apostolic. It's grounded in the sending of beloved sons and daughters. And the Lord commissions us today to be on this journey, to value this heart journey of sonship. Father, I thank you for this company of people. Can you just put your hands out before the Lord? Father, come and rest upon us with the glory of your great love. Overshadow us, Lord, with a spirit of glory. Let the radiant love of our Father shine down upon us. And I want to declare to you, there is no more veil. The veil was rent at the cross. The veil was torn away. There's no membrane. There's no veil. There's nothing between you and the Father. You are now living under an open heaven. And this infinite love of our Father is just being lavished upon us, poured down from heaven upon our hearts. It is transforming you. It is healing the broken places. Jesus said He was anointed by the Spirit to heal the brokenhearted. Everywhere He went, He poured out the adoptive love of heaven. And I've decreed that the Lord is pouring out on this house an anointing of adoptive love where we are so full of this supernatural love of God that our hearts are overflowing and and we can adopt others into our lives. No longer holding people at arm's length, but adopting just as you have adopted us, Father. Fill us, Lord, with an adoptive love that would heal the broken places inside of us, Lord. Heal our hearts, God. Heal our hearts of the orphan wound. You know, I was raised in a family that couldn't express love. My parents are in their 80s now and they're only just starting to use the word love. They weren't able because they had their own brokenness. They weren't able to minister that adoptive love to my heart. And I'm a pastor of a church and I, I minister to a lot of people who have come out of some really broken lifestyles. They need this adoptive love that we are experiencing. And I just decree an increase of adoptive love in the house. Lord, that you would just pour it out upon us relentlessly, that all of us would not just know that you love us, but we would feel that you love us, Lord. We would feel the embrace of heaven. As Passion Translation says in Romans 8, that we will no longer feel like orphans, but we will feel loved. So, Father, I thank you for the outpouring of your adoptive love. And we look up into your face today, Father, and we thank you that your face shines down upon us. The glory of the sun shines down upon us. And that every time we come to you in prayer, we just lift our eyes up to you, Lord. 
And already you are there pursuing us, chasing us, Lord, chasing us. When we go astray, Lord, you chase us. You leave the 99 and you pursue us, Lord. Your reckless love pursues us. And Father, I just want to thank you for your love today. There is nothing greater than the love of God, our Father. The greatest thing is love. And we decree the outpouring of His love in this place today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let's just drink in His presence just for those few moments. Let's just enter into that place of contemplative prayer where we just contemplate the words that we've just been listening to for the last 45 minutes. The voice, the voice of a son speaking in the midst of the church. The spirit of the son entering our hearts, making all things new. Glorious new creation, sons and daughters rising up all over the earth, carrying the message of the adoptive love of our beautiful Father. Lord, mess us up with your love. Wreck us with your love. Let us just be overwhelmed by your love, Lord. We pray for hearts that are just inebriated by love, Lord. Just impacted by the love of our Father. Remove every blockage, Lord. Remove every hindrance in our heart to receiving this great love. Some of you are going to experience a baptism of love here this morning. Because this is the ministry of heaven to immerse us in love, to fill us with love. To say, Lord, I receive your love. I receive your love. We just break off that old orphan identity in the name of Jesus. And we say, Orphans no more, but now adopted sons and daughters. Old orphan behaviors, old orphan thinking, passing away, passing away. And this new heart rising within us that cries, Papa, Daddy, Father, dear Father, Abba, thank you, Lord. Pour it out, Lord. I just want to bring to your attention, there's a couple of copies of this book at the back if you want to grab one. This is my newest book, The Glory of God and Supernatural Transformation. It's a theology of orphans to sons. There's just a few there, but just wanted to say that just before we close. But I, I just got a feeling we should close with some worship. What do you think, Jason? Just in response. Can we do that? Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you.